Ten years ago, if you were an unskilled, unemployed pyromaniac, you could always be sure of work during the last two weeks of June at one of the many Red Devil firework stands that sprung up around L.A. County. The only job qualifications necessary were a moron's grasp of simple arithmetic and being crazy or desperate enough to want to work 12-hour shifts at the height of summer in a screened-in, corrugated, aluminum-roofed shack surrounded by roughly three tons of explosives. I didn't have to make a job application. At the beginning of every summer, I threw wild all-night parties that usually went on non-stop for days on end. When one of the drunken revelers asked how I could do this and still hold down a job, I explained that I didn't have one. He said he could help me out, and scrawled an address on the side of a Coors carton. I reported there the next morning, bleary-eyed and hungover, with five other guests who'd spent the night and were in the same condition. We were hired on the spot. The stand was located at the intersection of Robertson and Venice in Culver City, and our co-workers seemed fresh from the county correctional facilities. There was a cholo who showed up every day, no matter how hot it was, in corduroy house slippers and a wool Pendleton buttoned to the neck. He had an 18th Street tattoo on his hand and his girlfriend's initials pierced into his ear. There was a black woman who must have weighed an easy 275 who constantly complained about her feet in a whiny South Carolina accent. And then there was Roger, a genial octogenarian who did nothing but guzzle beer all day in the corner while he pulled apart piccolo peats and sonic screamers, added new fuses and turned them into bootleg Roman candles. He turned out to be the boss of the operation. Then there were the six of us, underage punk rockers, artists, and alcoholics. We fit in perfectly. We soon knew the difference between ground bloom flowers and a cave of pearls, fountains and wizards, smoke bombs and magic snakes. It took two days to get on a beer-sharing basis with Roger, and soon there was an industrial-sized cooler of beer on ice available to anyone who wanted it. We learned from the posted signs that it was illegal to smoke within 300 yards of the stand, so cigarette breaks became a frequent group affair, especially when we learned that Julio, the 18th Street dude, always had killer buds. One of the girls I'd brought in began using the payphone on the premises to make bogus credit card calls to her boyfriend in England. Roger, after a fifth of Jack Daniels, just simply looked the other way. The day I decided to report for work in a skimpy halter top, he singled me out and showed me how to make bottle rockets. Occasionally, a sleek, ominous-looking black sedan would pull up to the side of the stand. A man in a crisp white shirt and sunglasses would open the trunk, and all the employees and most of the customers would cluster around, waving money. I asked Roger what was going on. He took a long swig of his beer, wiped his mouth on his sleeve, and said, Oh, he goes down to Mexico and comes back with real fireworks, none of this candy-ass shit. You could buy a quarter stick of dynamite from the guy for 30 cents. Next time the car pulled up, I was there. We returned home every night drunk out of our minds, exhausted and covered from head to toe with gunpowder, sawdust, and shredded newspaper. By the end of the first week, I knew that while Chinese fireworks have the most amazing colors, American fireworks are much louder. I also knew that a boiler maker was bourbon and beer mixed together, how many strategically placed cherry bombs it took to blow up a two-story house, and who the 18th Street gang was going to hit on next. My bottle rockets were starting to look pretty professional, too. One of my friends found out how to fudge the inventory and began taking home a case each of ground boom flowers and sparklers every day. We would sit at the cash register, with dried Elmer's glue smeared all over our hands in grotesque layers, and when a customer asked if the fireworks were safe, we'd say, safe and sane, and push the change through the screen with our mangled paws, watching the sheer horror register on their faces. We would whistle through our teeth, long and shrill, <whistles> and watch the rest of the staff frantically crawl on top of each other, trying to squeeze through the one narrow exit before the place blew sky high. Towards the fourth, we'd pull all-nighters at the stand, listening to the sex pistols and the Ramones and the woman's complaints about her aching feet. The fourth itself was an anticlimax. We spent it on the beach at Santa Monica, but now, being insiders, we couldn't really get into the family-style display. We wanted volume. We wanted power. We wanted total destruction. Besides, Roger had passed out inside the stand, and we were all too chicken to light off any of the rockets he'd so lovingly prepared. 
Instead, we dropped a trail of stolen ground bloom flowers all the way from the ocean to Hollywood out the back window of our car. Up all night, the morning of the 5th, we showed up at the stand and the site was utterly deserted. Gone, completely desolate, nothing left but some shreds of red, white, and blue bunting and a few dud lady fingers laying in the dirt. Later in the week, I got my final check and a handwritten note asking if I wanted to work in December at a Christmas tree lot. I declined. <laughs>